Listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio AM820 brings you Family Sanctuary, a show that inspires living the gospel message in word and deed within our families. And now, Family Sanctuary with host Peggy Hartshorn. Welcome to Family Sanctuary, focusing on life-giving relationships and the family. I'm your host, Peggy Hartshorn, chairman of Heartbeat International that advances life-affirming pregnancy help around the world. We're focusing now on a series of programs on Family Sanctuary on issues surrounding the dignity of the person, especially on abortion. With the fall of Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs case, abortion is now front and center again, and there are efforts in almost every state, including here in Ohio, to make abortion a right in our Constitution. So now's the time to understand the truth about abortion the science, and also what our church teaches, because there are so many lies that you'll be hearing in the media, online, and even perhaps from friends and family. So now's the time to learn and share the truth. Today, our program is on abortion and the question of human development, because many times now in in the media talking about abortion, you'll hear a lot about the dangers of abortion itself or the lack of danger uh, to women. But what about the unborn child? And our guest today is an expert on this subject. And uh, I'm so excited for you to, to meet him, to hear some of what he has to share with us about the beauty of human development. And actually, as a person who's been involved in, in pro-life since 1973, uh, our expert today has shared things recently at the Heartbeat International Conference that I was even totally unaware of in terms of the amazing work <laughs> that God is doing in the womb with the development of the human being. Each of us uh, went through these beautiful stages of development as orchestrated by our creator. And some of some of the details are just absolutely so beautiful. I'm eager for you to hear. So our guest is Dr. Callum Miller. He's a medical doctor and a researcher in the UK. As a researcher at Oxford University, he published a wide range of papers on abortion, among other topics, and has won prizes from the University of Oxford and the Royal College of Psychiatrists for his work on bioethics. He also has a master's degree with distinction in biblical studies. Dr. Miller has spoken around the world to professionals and politicians on the topic of abortion and often appears in mainstream media in the UK. So welcome, Dr. Miller. I'm so excited that you're here with us on the program. Welcome. Thank you for having me on. I can't wait for our listeners to hear your beautiful voice as well. Uh, so as as I mentioned, Dr. Miller is such an expert on so many areas of the abortion question. But we want him to share with us today a little more of what he knows and has discovered and has shared around the world on human development. So Dr. Miller, let me turn it over to you. Um, as you have have chosen this as one of your medical specialties, somehow the whole arena of, of human development and its beauty must have intrigued you early on. Is that correct in your studies? It is, yeah. So I became pro-life at medical school. And part of the reason for that was that I should no longer be kind of lied to or tricked about what a fetus actually was. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, you hear these people say that there's no heartbeat. It's just, uh, you know, a bunch of cardiac tissue contracting, which is exactly what a heartbeat is. Um, <laughs> and then you hear people saying, we don't know when life begins and that kind of thing. And, you know, the fact that I had studied embryology in my first year just meant that I was kind of immunized against all those lies, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it made it very difficult for people to come up with, you know, clearly false information like that. Um, it had to be really about, you know, is this a morally significant person or does the woman's choice outweigh that um but you know in terms of the basic biology in terms of the fact that this was a human individual who began at fertilization that stuff was just not controversial um after i had you know did first year embryology so mm -hmm. yeah over time i gradually saw the reality of abortion i saw the reality of the impact on women and all the way through medical school i knew that this was a living human being. So yeah, that kind of set me 
um, initially off in my journey on becoming pro-life and eventually speaking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, the the Supreme Court here in the United States back in 73 said there's that one of their statements was there's no agreement on when human life begins. And of course, as you've just indicated, that's totally uh, incorrect <laughs> based on science. It's amazing. And I'm so thankful that uh, embryology books and, and science is still teaching the truth about human development biologically. Um, and this maybe takes us on a little rabbit trail, but let me ask you briefly, why do you think that the medical profession ignores this uh, or, or seems to disregard it? Or um, why are you one of the few, unfortunately, well-educated medical professionals who who uh, has been ignoring or at least um, not promoting this idea of the beauty of human development from the moment of conception. Yeah, I think there are a few reasons, and one of them is clearly ideological. <laughs> you know, it, mm -hmm. it's in certain people's interest to kind of not even lie about the science, but just obscure the science and say that maybe we don't know or there's debate when really there isn't any. So mm -hmm. there was a study a few years ago, a survey by University of Chicago researcher Stephen Jacobs, who interviewed about, well, firstly, he interviewed the public and said, who is the expert about when life begins? And 80% of the public said biologists. Mm -hmm. So there is quite a broad agreement across the public that this is a scientific biological question. And so therefore, we have to ask the question, well, what does science say about it? So he asked five and a half thousand biologists, when does a new individual human organism begin to exist? And he found that 95% of them said at fertilization. <laughs> um, I think that illustrates one of the other sort of reasons people maybe don't say fertilization straight away is because sometimes we talk about this in quite a vague way. We say, when does life begin? Which, you know, if you take it, in a sort of certain sense, you could say, well, my mother was alive, her mother was alive, her mother was alive. And so life began, you know, thousands or millions of years ago. And so we have to be a bit more precise when we're talking about the beginning of life. What we're actually saying is when does a new individual human being begin to exist, a human organism? And when you make it clearer like that, the answer is a lot more obvious. So he asked them, when does a new individual human organism begin to exist? 95% said at fertilization. And so he then asked them, are you pro-life or pro-choice? Or are you politically liberal, politically conservative or something else? And what's interesting is that he found that even 70% of those people who said, of the biologists, who said that they were very pro-choice, even 70% of those said that life begins at fertilization. Mm. So even among the most kind of hardcore pro-choice biologists, there's still a pretty clear kind of super majority who, who believe the science that life begins at fertilization. Now, he then published an article um, separate from this first one, I think it was in Quillette where he basically said what happened when I published this article or when I did this survey. And he basically details a few people who wrote back to him saying, you're just a pro-life fascist or, you know, all this crazy stuff they say these days. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think that also gives an indication of why it wasn't a hundred percent. It's right. not because the science is, is unclear. It's just because there were some people who saw the implications of this politically and so decided to kind of disrupt the results of the survey and say that we don't know when life begins or it begins some other time. So mm -hmm. I think most of it is political. I think the reality is most people know that life begins at fertilization. But of course, that forces us to reckon with the question of the unborn child and their rights. And of course, many people don't want us to be able to do that. Right. And that's why we're focusing on this question today that the topic, the title of our program is abortion and the question of human development. So, um, Dr. Callum, uh, tell us some of the marvelous details. I remember your presentation with the Heartbeat International Conference recently, and you were educating those of us in the pregnancy help movement about some of the beauties of human development, just amazing facts and, and uh, uh, that, that I really was not totally familiar with myself. Let's start with just some of the early days of, of conceptions, the first, the first few weeks. And, you know, there are laws in the United States in some states that protect human life now uh, from the moment of fertilization. 
one of the the other um, uh, approaches that have been taken in some states is what's called the heartbeat bill, uh, prohibiting abortion once the human heartbeat can be detected uh, through an ultrasound. So those early those early weeks and and early months tell us about some of the beauties of human development and how we already see um, that we're dealing here with a human being at the earliest stages of development. Sure. So I think we probably have to begin just with a bit of clarification, just because it can get a little technical. Um, there are actually two ways that people um, kind of age a pregnancy or age the child. One is from the last period, because that's the most obvious thing for most women is when was our last period. And so that's how pregnancy is normally calculated. And that's gestational age. But because fertilization actually takes place two weeks after the last period. Um, there's another way of calculating a baby's age, which is from fertilization, which is the sort of more accurate age in a sense, because that's when the life actually begins. And so sometimes you'll see a kind of two week discrepancy. Just as an example, the heart begins to beat at two to three weeks after fertilization. But that would be four to five weeks after the last period. And so you get this sort of two week discrepancy and some people get a bit confused by that. So <laughs> it's worth just pointing that out to begin with. But as I said, the, the heartbeat does begin very early. We traditionally thought this was 22 days after fertilization. But there's some research from the University of Oxford, which suggests more recently that it could be as early as 16 days after fertilization that the heart begins to beat. Now, what this means is that by just the end of four weeks after conception, the heart has already beaten a million times. And for all of us sitting there at our computers or in our cars, wherever we're listening to this, that means that our heart beating in our chest right now has been beating every single second since that moment, since just mm. 16 days after conception, which is a really remarkable thought, I think, when you wow. when you reflect on it. Wow. Yes, that is absolutely amazing. And so even though now technology can, uh, with, with the ultrasound or a sonogram, can detect a heartbeat around, is it around six weeks of gestational age or six weeks from fertilization? Uh, I believe that would be gestational age. I, so I think so too. Um, it's, and it's it's remarkably soon after the heart develops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's maybe like mm -hmm. a week or two after the heart actually exists. And so it's really, really amazing just how quick the ultrasound can pick it up. Right. Um, but yeah, the heart will be there a little bit before that even. Mm -hmm. So even before the technology can pick it up now, uh, the human heart is beating, uh, which is Absolutely amazing. And you said in uh, it, by the time it can be picked up, um, it's already been beating one million times. Is that what you said? So, so by the end of four weeks, by the end of four weeks, conception. Mm -hmm. So that's six weeks of, of gestational, gestational age. Six weeks since the last period. And I think that's when. A million times. Yes, I yeah. think that's when we can first pick it up with an ultrasound. Generally, um, that is yeah. absolutely amazing. So. Um, and I think, did you say earlier, what is the euphemism that the other side is trying to say when we're talking about a human heartbeat? What are they calling it? <laughs> they call it all sorts of things. It's remarkable. Um, so I, I think they, they will say something like it's, you know, cardiac electrical activity. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone who studies biology or medicine knows that, well, what is the heartbeat? You get some electrical activity in a bit of the heart. It goes through the cardiac tissue into the cardiac muscle and it causes that muscle to contract. And that's what causes the heart to beat and which pumps blood around the body. Mm. So to say that this is not a heartbeat, this is just heart muscle contracting as a result of electricity. is really just um, as, as deceptive as you can get. I mean, I don't know if they still have it, but I remember looking on Planned Parenthood's website a couple of years ago and they even said on their website for women who are keeping their baby, I think it was at the six week stage, they said, your baby's heart is beginning to beat or something like that. Mm, mm, <laughs> um, wow. So even on the Planned Parenthood website, they used to say this, is, you know, the heart is beating at six weeks or so. And then, of course, 
all the states started bringing in heartbeat bills and so they had to change strategy and start denying that this was true and saying right. it was misinformation so yeah it's really quite amazing just what links they will go to well let me introduce our guest um you can see what a what an expert we have with us today dr callum miller is a medical doctor and researcher in the uk and as a researcher, he's published a wide range of papers on abortion, among other topics, and has won prizes from the University of Oxford and Royal College of Psychiatrists for his work in bioethics. And uh, he also has a degree in biblical studies. So he's coming to us. Actually, I forgot to mention this in the beginning. He's speaking to us right now from London, England, although he travels all over the world uh, for his professional um, work, as well as working uh, with people in pro-life around the world and educating them uh, in phenomenal ways in what he uh, has come to become an expert uh, in so many areas related to abortion. So, Dr. Miller, let's now we've got uh, we're about halfway through our program, but I would love for you to just give us some highlights of some of the amazing things that the unborn child does <laughs> in the womb uh, and 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 how actually amazingly sophisticated uh, the embryo and the fetus really are. How us human beings in each of our individual stages of development um, really had such a phenomenal uh, growth and uh, we could do so many things even before we were born. <laughs> Let's talk about some of those things. Sure. So yeah, let me just list some things just from the first trimester then maybe we can talk about later in pregnancy after that. So we know that the baby begins, to, uh, all of these, I should say, I'm not going <laughs> to translate it for every single fact, but all of these are going to be embryological age, which means from the time of conception. The first movements from the baby are at just four to five weeks after conception. At six weeks, you can record brain waves, coordinated brain waves in the baby. At seven weeks, the baby has taste buds and they can hiccup and suck and swallow. At eight weeks, at eight weeks, uh, the baby begins to start breathing or trying to breathe because she's breathing breathing in fluids. At nine weeks, the baby begins to yawn. Uh, at 10 weeks, probably the baby can feel pain, though we don't know for sure. Um, and all of that is in within the first trimester. So when people say, oh, abortion is bad if it's really late, but if it's the first trimester, then it's just a clump of cells. Again, we know this is not true. Um, even by the end of the first trimester, all the organs are there. The baby is perfectly formed. And even halfway through this trimester, the baby is already capable of doing a lot of different things. And so, yeah, that really, I think, surprises most people. It surprised probably most of us in medical school as well. But that is the, the scientific reality of mm -hmm. the baby's very, very early development. That's amazing. And, you know, most of the laws that are being introduced now in the states, like, for instance, in the state of Ohio, that would give an unlimited right to abortion, it says something like, uh, abortion could be prohibited after viability, although the individual doctor just decides when that is. It could be the abortionist deciding whether the baby's viable, but still could be provided if it is for the life or health of the mother. And of course, in the U.S., we have a body of law that includes mental health and emotional health as part of health. So really, we're talking about an unlimited right throughout the pregnancy, not just in the first trimester. So let's look at what about the development after that first three months is, is phenomenal. Tell us about that in the fourth, fifth, and sixth months, for example. Sure. Well, let me just pick up on something you mentioned, which is about the way that health can be used as an as argument for abortion for any reason. Um, this is actually easy to see if you look at the UK. So the UK, technically, when you look at the abortion law from 1967, it says abortion is only allowed if the mother's life is at risk, or if the baby has a disability, or if there's a threat to her physical or mental health. And so that is the same law that you would find in very, many very conservative countries, many very conservative US states. Um, it's the same law as in most of Africa and many, many you know, conservative pro-life parts of the world. So it sounds very strict and limited and relatively pro-life, but in the UK, mental health means you can have an abortion for any reason. Mm -hmm. So one in four pregnancies in the UK ends in abortion. One in three women will have an abortion in her lifetime. And we know that any reason for an abortion counts. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a doctor and you say, 
I don't want a baby girl. I wanted a baby boy. And so I'd like an abortion. The doctor could ask you, do you think that having a baby girl would affect your emotions? And the woman might say yes. And the doctor says, okay, so then it will affect your mental health and mm-hmm. they will do an abortion, or at least they can do an abortion legally. Right. Um, virtually any reason at all, you can just say it would affect my emotions and that counts for mental health purposes or even affect my finances or social situation. And so the UK is a great illustration because our law is exactly that. It says you can only have an abortion if the child has a disability or for health reasons. Mm-hmm. And in practice, we have abortion on demand and no one really denies that. So, And the same is to, true to in the US. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. The yeah. Statistics are very similar to that. So what exactly. happens to uh, the baby? Yeah. What uh, What is the baby's, baby's development at these later stages? When it just if it would affect the mother's emotions, the baby could be aborted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as you move into the second trimester at 12 weeks, we know that the baby can interact with uh, other babies. And how do we possibly know that? (laughs) Because it's (laughs) tiny and it's inside the womb. Well, the reason is that babies move their arms around within the womb a lot. And when they move their hands near to their eyes or their face, they slow down because they have a protective instinct so that they don't hurt their face or their eyes. (laughs) Now, what's amazing is that they've studied twin babies in the womb, and they found that when twin babies move their arms around, if they go towards their twin's face or body, they will slow down in the same way. Mm -hmm. Again, because they have a kind of protective instinct because there's another human being there. Um, At 14 weeks after conception, if you sing the baby a song outside the womb, the baby will hear inside the womb. And she will actually move her mouth and tongue in response. She Mm. will try to start singing along with you. Um, At 15 to 16 weeks, the baby can uh, respond to taste. And so she can taste food that her mother has eaten. And so we know later in pregnancy, the baby even remembers those tastes. So it's a very practical tip. If you want your baby to like Chick-fil-A, as any good parent would, (laughs) what you have to do is eat Chick-fil-A towards the end of your pregnancy, maybe throughout the third trimester. Because the baby will actually, obviously, you know, newborn babies shouldn't be eating (laughs) really (laughs) solid stuff. Um, But you get the point that the baby prefers the food that the mother has eaten during pregnancy, and they remember the taste. Mm. Um, Likewise, when it comes to the songs, later in pregnancy, the baby remembers songs or poems or anything like that, that the mother has sung to her. And so when the baby comes out, she's actually more likely to stop crying. If you play those songs that she recognizes, um, it's really, really incredible. It's beautiful. So, yeah, exactly. I think it's, again, it's a practical tip. If you want your baby <laughs> to like Justin Bieber, <laughs> you have to play Justin Bieber <laughs> during pregnancy. Um, it's really amazing, you know, just how much they remember. They can even detect if you sing the wrong note. Oh, my goodness. So if you sing the song and then you make a mistake, the baby will look at you and notice oh. that you sang the wrong thing. Oh, my goodness. Um, they, they recognize the mother's voice, so they can distinguish their mother's voice from other voices. They can distinguish their mother's accent and language as well. So there was actually a study showing that when French babies come out of the womb, they cry in a French accent. (laughs) And when German babies come out of the womb, they cry in a German accent. Now, Mm. this isn't because they're genetically massively different. Um, It's because of what they've heard in the womb, and they actually begin to pick up that accent, even in the womb themselves. So it's really incredible to think, you know, people will say, you know, the baby isn't valuable because it's not self-aware, it's not conscious, it's not able to feel pain or these sorts of things. The reality is that certainly at some point in pregnancy, it can do most things that, you know, a one-year-old could do. Mm. <laughs> um, Absolutely the baby amazing. Cries, the baby even cries in the womb by 23 weeks. And we have ultrasound videos. If you go to my website, you can see a video of the baby crying inside the womb at 23 weeks. Um, And even though it's completely pitch black and dark in the womb, because um, they have some visual awareness, they can even see very, very, um, uh, they can see some things in their visual field, and they can recognize certain patterns. Now, most people know that Babies have very poor vision, even once they're born, it's very blurry, they can't see much. 
But even within the womb, they can begin to recognize at least some very, very basic patterns. And if you think, well, how could they do that? Because it's dark inside and that kind of thing. If you close your eyes in the dark, in the room, in a, in a dark room, and then you turn the light on, you will notice even with your eyes shut <laughs> because the light still kind of goes through your eyelids to some extent and you can still recognize where it's coming from. And it's similar like that with the baby in the womb. So as I say, it's really remarkable just how much we know now. And there's much more like that as well. So oh, those well. are just some of the things that happen later in pregnancy. Thank you so much for sharing some of those highlights. I wish we had another hour to hear more of the beauty of of what happens in the womb as each of us individually, each individual grows and develops in such a similar way, uh, according to God's plan. Well, I wish we had more time, Dr. Miller, but we don't. We have to conclude our program. But thank you for mentioning. I want to mention your blog where people can uh, find more information at Callum's blog, C-A-L-U-M-S, callumsblog.com. Uh, I understand the Q&A section of that has lots of additional information, uh, all kinds of questions relating to not only fetal development, but abortion uh, it's in, in general and women's health related to abortion and so forth. Also, you can uh, consult callummiller.com. I'm sorry, dot org, C-A-L-U-M, callummiller.org. So Dr. Miller, thank you so much for being our guest today. Um, as I said, I've been in the movement, pro-life movement since 1973 and and what has been learned now and discovered and documented about the unborn child is so much different and more, uh, even more beautiful than we knew <laughs> years and years ago. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, you have been listening to The Family Sanctuary on St. Gabriel Catholic Radio. And I'm your host, Peggy Hartshorn. To find this program again and other programs from Family Sanctuary, go to stgabrielradio.com, choose podcasts, then Family Sanctuary. And if you're looking for our series on abortion, search for the word abortion, and you will find Dr. Callum Miller and several other wonderful programs to help you understand this issue more fully. Family Sanctuary is broadcast at four o'clock on Saturdays and two o'clock on Sundays. So please join us again to strengthen our families and make them sanctuaries of life as God intends. Family Sanctuary is a production of listener-supported St. Gabriel Catholic Radio, AM820. Archives of Family Sanctuary with Peggy Hartshorn are available at stgabrielradio.com.